All right, so here we are again with another video of the Rustlings tutorial. And it looks like today we're gonna talk a little bit about primitive types in Rust. You know the drill, if you wanna check out the other videos of this playlist, make sure to check out the description below because I've linked it there. And without further ado, we're gonna start right away. I've already executed Rustlings watch from the Rustlings repository. And here we see our first compiler error, which seems to be in primitive types 1.rs. And it says that there's basically a syntax error, it seems, because it expected an identifier, but it found a keyword in line 16. Let's take a look at the hint of this exercise. Huh, seems like there are no hints this time. So let's just open up the file in exercises, primitive types, and then primitive types 1.rs. Okay, so here we see we have a variable called is morning, which is set to true, and then it seems to be outputting good morning, if it is indeed true. And here we see another condition that checks whether is evening is truthy or not. Looks like, yeah, finish the rest of this line like the example or make it be false. Sure. Well, then let's go ahead and say we have a variable is evening and we set it to false. And then we see what the compiler says. Oh, of course, there's a semicolon missing here. Fix that really quick. And here we see it is compiling. Cool. We get the output here, good morning. And of course we can go ahead and set it to true, which then should cause it to output good morning and good evening. Okay, cool. That was an easy one. So let's remove the comment and check out the next exercise. Okay, so now in primitive types two, again, we have some syntax error there. Let's just um, ask for a hint before we open up the file. Again, no hints this time. I'm going to switch over to my editor and open up primitive types 2.rs. Okay, so it seems that this exercise is about characters. We see a variable, my first initial, which is the character C, and then it checks whether it is alphabetic, which is a built-in method that's defined on the character type. And it also checks whether it is numeric and it's going to output it is alphabetical or numerical or none of these respectively. Now here we can create our own variable that is called your character. And there's a little comment that says try a letter, try a number, try a special character, try a character from a different language than your own. Try an emoji. Okay, let's do that. So uh, our character first is gonna be my capital letter. So I'm gonna add a P here, and the output here is the same. I'm gonna save that. Both of these are alphabetical. Cool. So let's change that to a character that is a number, three in this case, and we see that it outputs, it is numerical. So we can see that um, Rust here has a dedicated type for characters. If you're coming from other languages, you probably know that there's strings. You might have an idea already that in Rust, there is strings and references to strings, and then there's stirs and references to stirs, and these are all uh, individual types, in fact. But characters uh, are their own type as well. So um, whenever you're dealing with single characters, you probably want to use a, a, a character type. And the character type is created using this syntax that we've used here. So notice the difference that if we would create this variable here and we would do it with, uh, let's say, these uh, double quotes, as we would do with you know, strings and other languages, these are two different things in Rust. Uh, so keep that in mind. Chars are created using single quotes. Okay, um, coming back to the exercise, we tried an alphabetical, we tried a numerical. Let's put in an emoji. So I'm going to open up the built-in emoji menu, and let's put in a little Rust emoji. Okay, cool. Uh, don't forget to close the single quote and save that file. And here we see that outputs, it's neither alphabetic nor numeric. That's it for this exercise. So removing the comment and starting the next one. In primitive types three, 
There is another expected expression, a syntax error. So let's check for a hint again. The hint says there's a shorthand to initialize arrays with a certain size that does not require you to type in 100 items, but you certainly can if you want to. For example, you can do, and then we have let array, are we there yet? And then 10. So notice here that there's the semicolon after the first item. What this says in Rust Basic is it's creating an array with 10 items and each of them are pre-filled with a value, in this case, the string, are we there yet? Then there's a bonus hint that says, what are some other things you could have that would return true for a.ling greater equals 100? So let's start with the first uh, general exercise and open up the file primitive types 3.rs. Here it says again, create an array with at least 100 elements in it where the question mark is. So here we saw that the syntax is basically square brackets and we can give it any kind of items in here, it seems. There doesn't seem to be any restriction as to what we put in there. So I'm gonna put in the string hello world in here and say that it's having 100 fields and saving the file, let's see what happens. Okay, cool, this is compiling. Let's check that other hint again, because I'm not sure I really understood what this was about. So what are some other things you could have that would return true for a.ling greater equals 100? What are other things that we could have? Mm, not really sure what other things we could have. Probably other arrays with 100 elements. Not really sure, to be honest. Um, let's let's leave that out for now and move on to the next one. Okay, so in primitive types four, let's take a look at the hint. Okay, so take a look at the understanding ownership slices other slices section of the book. So for those who don't know, there is a book that's available to you for free online on doc.rustlang.org slash book. And this is what this hint is referring to. So go to that section in the book and use the starting and ending indices of the items in the array that you want to end up in the slice. If you're curious why the first argument of assert equals does not have an ampersand for reference, since the second argument is a reference, take a look at the DREF coercions section of the book. Okay, so let's just open up that link here and in case we need it we can then take a look at it um so i'm gonna open up another browser window paste the link here and this seems to be a broken link yep there was an l missing in the url all right so here's the slice type chapter and we can see a bunch of things here can i close this yeah wonderful Okay, before we dive deeper into that, in case we need it, let's first actually look at the exercise. So I'm going to open up primitive types four. Okay, so here we see that we have an array with a bunch of values, one, two, three, four, five. And then there's this variable nice slice. That's the one that we need to create out of this existing one. And then we have this assertion here that expects that nice slice is going to be the same as an array that just has two, three, and four. So the hint said that we should take advantage of this special syntax that lets us get certain values uh, at certain indices from, from collections like arrays. I actually don't really know the syntax from the top of my head right now, so let's open up the book again and, and take a look. Okay, so at, at this point, we should probably talk a little bit about what slices are, because otherwise it doesn't make really a lot of sense here. Slices is a data type that usually pretty much all the time is a reference to some other data in memory. So for example, you probably know about references in Rust in general, uh, that a reference is a pointer that points to some other data. A slice can give you access to a section of that particular data. That can be quite useful when you deal with strings and also with arrays, as in this particular case. So for example, to give you an idea, and we see this here in the book as well. So here we have that array that we're seeing in our exercise. And it's an array with a bunch of fields, one, two, three, four, five. We can get access to a section of that particular data by uh, creating a slice from it. And down here, we can see what that looks like. So we're saying that we're creating a reference to that array and then you see the syntax here with the square brackets where we say this is our start index and this is our finishing index, if you will. 
And what this says is, okay, I'm creating a pointer that gives you access to the section. And this section is everything that is starting at the start index in this case one and the finishing index is three what's important to note is that the finishing index is not included in the section that you get access to so if we take these indices from here then we would get a slice that points to two and three because two is at the starting index one right zero one and the finishing index is three. So zero, one, two, three, four is at three, but it's excluding the finishing index. So what we get is a slice of two and three. Now, if we apply that to the exercise that we're dealing with right now, then what we would need to do is we create a reference to our array. We see in our assertion down here that we want a slice that represents the section two, three, and four. So two here is at index one. So we put in one. And because we want four to be part of that section, we have to put our finishing index at wherever four is plus one. So in this case, zero, one, two, three, plus one. So that's four. Applying this here, so one dot dot four, and then saving the file should compile the program. Cool, so that works. I'm gonna remove the comment and move on to the next one. Okay, so in primitive types five, we have another syntax error asking for a hint again. Here it says, take a look at the data types tuple type section of the book. And here we have a link again, so I'm gonna take this one right away. This time I'm not missing any character, copying it and pasting it in here particularly the part about destructuring second to last example in this section. You'll need to make a pattern to bind name and age to the appropriate parts of the tuple. You can do it. Yeah, we can do it. Okay, let's open up the file. Uh, primitive types number five. Let's see what we're dealing with here. Okay, so here we have a variable cat that holds a tuple. Just really quick, a tuple is a collection type that can give you a list of values that can be of different types. So if you compare that to, for example, arrays, those are values of a single type. So in the previous exercise, we had an array of I32s and they're of fixed length. When you're dealing with vectors, it's the same thing. Even though they can grow in size, the values in there still have to be the same. Tuples, however, allow you to have multiple types in a single collection. So that, that can make sense in a bunch of cases. For example, as we can see here, when you aim to store data about a cat and the data has to be the name and the H, uh, this could be wonderfully put into a tuple. Of course, there's other ways to do this. You can use structs and more complex data structures, but depending on your case, a tuple might be enough. Okay, so now that we know what tuples are, let's see what needs to happen here. So obviously we have to put a pattern here. The pattern that we're looking for is a syntax that lets us destructure the tuple data that we're dealing with. And this turns out to be a very declarative syntax. So because we can see that we have a tuple here with a name and age, we could say something like let and then name age equals cat. Now this is telling Rust to deconstruct the cat tuple that we're dealing with into its first field, which we call name, and into its second field, which we call h. And this then gives us access to each of these properties individually as variables. So let's save this. And the program is compiling. All right, removing the comment and moving on to the last one. In primitive types six, we have another syntax error asking for a hint as always. Okay, why you could use a destructuring let for the tuple here, try indexing into it instead. As explained in the last example of the chapter mentioned in the previous exercise. And now you have another tool in your toolbox. Okay, cool. So let's open up the file and see what's going on here. Primitive types six. Okay, right, so we have a tuple with the values one, two, three. It's stored in a numbers variable. And here we are apparently trying to access the second number so we can output it here. So we see we have a, we have an assertion here that says two equals second. So that's this one right here. 
Now, how do we get access to that? We could go ahead and take this and say, let first, second, third equals to numbers and then get rid of this one and then save. And then this is probably just gonna work fine. Yep, but as the hint said, we should solve this exercise by using a different syntax in which we're indexing into the fields of the tuple. Now, how is that done? We can actually dot into the fields of a tuple using the dot syntax. So I could just say numbers dot one because it's the field at index one in the numbers variable. And this will give me access to the value that I'm interested in. See, so this is perfectly compiling. And, and just as you would expect, if you would say something like numbers dot zero, this would give you one instead of two. So this is gonna break the program. All right, so I'm gonna put this back and remove the comments. And that's it with this video about primitive types in Rust. Thanks for watching and make sure to check out the other videos as well.